Hi, everyone. How's that sound? Good. All y'all in the back can hear me. Um, and I can hear you too. Hi, my name is Mary. My pronouns are she and her. Welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, how many of you are here? How many of you are here for the first time? <laughs> Great, welcome. <laughs> Me too. I haven't been here since August. It's nice to be here in San Francisco. Um, I drove up today from uh, LA. It's beautiful. The uh, Central Valley is green. I know. Huh? <laughs> so, um, so we'll do uh, a the traditional period of. Oh, you know what? I duh. Let's go around and just say our names. And so, sorry. Yeah. Oh, Great. Hi. Welcome. Glad you're all here. And so, um, is there anyone new to meditation? Excellent. You're all pants. I did this. Oh, um, I did this. Uh, I did an online thing on Sunday. They told me halfway through that all I could do was all I heard was my breathing. So um, it doesn't sound like my breathing is like, okay, good. So we'll have a half an hour of meditation and then we'll have a little um, stretch and then we'll have um, uh, some Dharma. And since you've all been practicing for a while, I'm going to offer just a light and light guided meditation, not a whole bunch of direction, but I always like to invite you to be gentle with yourselves, really set an intention to be kind. Uh, so often we can get into a place of judgment about how well or how poorly we're, we're sitting and get caught up in expectations of what it's supposed to be like and see if you can let go of that and just be kind, be friendly to your experience. Let go of that judgment and let it unfold the way it unfolds. You cannot make a mistake. You cannot make a mistake. And see if you notice yourself, um, if you notice yourself um, chastising yourself, even though you don't have an intention to do that, and then you begin to see how the mind of the mind of its own can designate way, even though it's not your intention. So um, those are my my um, my wishes for you that you're you're gentle with yourselves this evening. It's a, it's never a bad thing. Uh, are there any questions before we begin? No. Okay. So. Um, find a way to sit that's comfortable, that will be sustainable for the next half hour or so. Allow your eyes to close if that's comfortable. If that's not comfortable for you, you're welcome to keep your eyes open with a soft focus in front of you. And take a few moments to settle in. Really arrive in the room. Feel yourself on the chair. Feel yourself supported by the chair or the cushion. Feeling that foundation beneath you, that support of the earth. And take a moment or two to let go of any tension or tightness you might be holding, starting with the eyes, relaxing the eyes. The mouth, the jungle. Checking in with your posture, making sure that your back is upright, that you have integrity, integrity to your posture, but that your shoulders are relaxed, not hunched around your ears. Relax your arms, let them rest on your lap or your leg. Checking in the front of your torso, softening where you can. Maybe softening all the way down to your belly. And 
relaxing the back, the hips, the backside. Letting go of any holding in the legs, relaxing the thighs, the quadriceps, the calves, the feet. Relax into the present moment. Being aware of your body right here. And part of that body awareness is an awareness of the breath. The body is breathing without any help from you. Just be aware of that breath. The inhale and the exhale. Experiencing the body breathing on its own. Allow the breath of the body to be your anchor to the present time. You can return to them when you're distracted, drawn away by thinking, plans, memories. Spend these first few moments to coming back when you find yourself lost. And settling in to the now.
you see what the mind is like tonight. It may be dizzy, restless, bouncing from one thing to another. You may be caught in a plan or a memory. You may be calm, equanimity, and there may be dullness, sleepiness. None of these are wrong. You're simply aware of the state of mind. Recognizing that there may be some effort necessary to stay present. And be willing to make that effort. Letting go of any judgment. And being kind to yourself. Hmm. All of our senses are still active while we sit, while we're thinking, physical experience, or sound, smell, taste, insight. The experience of these sensations arise and pass. See if you can just receive them without going out towards them and grasping. You're resting on your foundation. And all your experiences arise and pass including the thoughts. They may be pleasant, they may be unpleasant, they may be either. We stay with them, whatever they are. 
as much as we can. Mindfulness can include all our experiences that you might be able to open to an awareness of your mental states, 
any emotions that might be present. You may connect with them in your body. Have an awareness as they pass through your mind. Again, they may be pleasant or unpleasant, different emotions arising, challenging, easy. We're willing to be with whatever is. We're saying, well, right now it's like this. Right now it's like this. We're not doing anything wrong, it's just what's unfolding. And we stay with it as much as we can.
Where are you right now? Right now, let's make this. Can we stay with our experience? Not getting caught up in wanting it to be different. Wishing it would change or not change. And hold it all with kindness.
And the last few moments of our practice this evening, I'm going to invite you to shift gears and bring to mind something or someone you feel grateful for, grateful to. Get a sense of that gratitude. It doesn't have to be anything grandiose. It could be something simple or mundane. Just something you are grateful for. And reflect on that gratitude, perhaps getting a sense of it in your body, receiving the feeling of gratitude. And sometimes if you put your hand over your heart, it helps to support that connection, that sensation. Any questions about the instructions or your experience? Yeah, I'd like to comment that um, your instruction at the beginning to be kind and be gentle and free of ourselves was very helpful. Mm -hmm. I really Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Yesterday I did this yesterday morning in a class I do. Somebody said, um, when I asked the question, where are you now? She realized that she was in a drugstore buying a product. She had no idea where it was. <laughs> <laughs> that happens. <laughs> it's great to all of a sudden notice you have no idea where you are or who you're with or what you're doing. Like, wow, the mind is amazing. So, okay, so um, traditionally, I think up here there's usually a break, at least as often as I come up here after the, the meditation. So let's, let's do a quick stretch break and why don't you say hi to someone you don't know? Just introduce yourself to someone you don't know if you need to. Run to the restroom, help you do that, and then we'll be back here. Uh, let's say 8 15. That's like four minutes. Ha uh ha. -huh. Yeah. 
But that's not why I practice. I practice so that I can be in the world with ease with whatever's going on. And so I'm always um, interested in, in speaking to that so that we don't, people don't come in like, Ugh, and then there's like, nothing's happening, everything is good. So the reason I talk about that is because when, when after Christchurch, um, I went through my notes and um, I have a lot of notes of classes I've done before. And unfortunately, I had notes on talks I gave after Charleston and Charlottesville and Orlando and Paris and Ferguson and on and on and on and on because there's a lot of shit going down out there. There's a lot of anger, there's a lot of hatred, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of insanity, and it can feel quite overwhelming. And we can get into a place of fear, we can get into a place of anger, we can get into a place of despair. And um, there's just this, this sense of what do I do? And so I wanted to just reflect on that and share some of my reflections that I did go through about this. Um, and how does Buddhism, you know, how does Buddhism show up in all of this? Um, you get the question, well, what's the Buddhist response? Are you a good Buddhist or a bad Buddhist? You know, I, don't I don't know. Um, so when I thought about this, my mind went in two different directions. Um, on how to respond to this. And so I want to touch on each of those. And the first one was love, which might seem like an, an uh, I don't know if it's an odd thing, but that's love was one of the branches that, that occurred to me. And because of the Buddhist teaching, um, hatred never ceases through hatred, only through love. And this is the eternal law. So the response to anger and hatred isn't more anger and hatred. It's really coming to it from a place of love and kindness and compassion. It's really the wise response, although it's, it's not the easy response, but it's an important response. It's really um, how I want to be able to show up, and it's what the Buddha says, how we need to show up. And it was right around that time, Ruth King, I'm on Ruth, I know some of you may know who Ruth King is, she's an amazing teacher. And she sends out a, a, a newsletter every month or so, and the newsletter that came out that week had a quote from Audrey Lord, and it said, we have to consciously study how to be tender with each other until it becomes a habit. We have to study how to be tender with each other until it becomes a habit. We don't want to be drawn into that anger and that hatred that consumes all these, so many people in the world. The greed, the, the hatred, the ignorance, the delusion that's driving this. That's why I come to practice. So I'm not caught up in that fear, that, that delusion that kept me blind for so many years. It's a, it's a way out. Um, people, what did they say? Hurt people, hurt people. The people causing the harm out there, um, they're, they, I think they, I think they're deluded to a very great extent and they're caught up in the idea that getting more will give them what they need or othering others if we only get rid of them then we'll be okay and it creates this separation it creates this othering that just causes we see it we see it happening right now at the border you know they're not they're not immigrants seeking asylum they're animals you 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 dehumanize and there's so much of that going on right now. So we don't want to fall into that trap. It's like, how do I not go to that direction? Oh, can I bring love and kindness to my practice? And I talked last night about the, the some of the Brahma Viharas and the near enemies of the Brahma Viharas, like what it's almost like. And one of the things about the Brahma Viharas is they're unconditional. There's no, I will love you if. It's really, no, I'm cultivating this intention of holding the world with um, loving kindness. That's the metta sutta, omitting none. We wish all beings well, omitting none. And um, 
Jack Kornfield says, by practicing with mindfulness, if mindfulness is what underpins and underlies it's the foundation of how we do this. We have to pay attention. Mindfulness is paying attention. When we're not paying attention, we can get drawn so easily into reacting into that anger, into that hatred, into that fear, into that running away, whatever whatever our natural inclination is, either, either lashing out or hiding. I'm going to run away or, you know, that's what, that was my MO. And now I, because of this practice and because of this mindfulness practice, it's like, oh, I don't have to run away anymore. There's not, that's not necessary. So Jack Hornfield says, by practicing with mindfulness, we align ourselves with those who refuse to hate and with each moment of compassion sow seeds of peace. We support the causes and conditions that reduce violence. We report we, we support the causes and conditions that reduce violence. You know, we it's it's a challenge, but um, hardening our hearts towards others doesn't do anything to them. But it's a hell of an impact on us. It's really painful whether we understand it or not. We shut ourselves off, we constrict ourselves, and we get into these tight little balls, whether we know it or not, whether we realize it or not, and we're living in this small, tight world. Whereas if we can open our hearts, then we really can't be hurt. I think it might have been another quote by Audrey Lord where um you know, we can't be hurt by that which, you know, people can't hurt us. So, I don't even butcher it. It's something about admitting what we admit to ourselves and about ourselves, people can't come and hurt us anymore. I don't know whether that falls in this, this thing, but it's like there's this ability to be at ease with ourselves, this cultivation of compassion for ourselves that allows us to be compassionate and loving towards others. So the way to this practice of love for others is through loving ourselves, through the practice of being kind and compassionate to us. Anybody ever try that? Easy, right? <laughs> no, it's not. Because we live in this world of, of um, getting all these messages about you're not good enough, you're, you know, you're, you're the wrong color, you're the wrong shape, you're you love the wrong person, you're just, just wrong, 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 wrong. And there's this systemic oppression that we just get just from walking around the world, walking around. It's just like, boom, 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 boom. It's subtle. Sometimes it's very overt, but much of the time it's subtle. And, and to um, recognize that that actually has an impact on us. And we're just never quite enough. Whereas the Buddha says, no, nah, you're, you're actually fine. You're actually enough. You're actually enough. Um, you know, there's a quote I found that I saw a few months ago from a woman named Emily McDowell. And it's, I don't have it written down, but it's something about bottom line. Is that there's, you're not finding yourself. You're not like a $10 bill you found in a pocket. It's really you're uncovering who you were before the world got its hands on you. You know, who are you before the world got its hands on you? So this cultivation of kindness and compassion for ourselves is so empowering. My journey has been the more I can forgive and be kind to myself, the more connected I am to the humanity with everyone else. The separation goes down because for me, the separation is up when I'm not good enough. When I'm, when I'm judging myself and staying away and fearful of what you're going to say or what's going to happen, then those walls go up. But the, wall, the more I can um, accept myself and be kind to myself, the easier it is to be kind to others. Not becoming a doormat. I think that's really an important recognition. We don't become doormats, and I'll talk to that more in a bit. But we want to offer kindness and compassion because it's the appropriate response. And there's a um, there's a quote here from George Decay from um, I think he's, this is in response to the when they had the shootings in Paris. So many quotes in response to so much of this 
car. Um, he said, um, right now, I'm writing this backstage at Allegiance. I think that's his, it was his Broadway show. My heart heavy with the news from Paris, aching for the victims and their families and friends. There no doubt will be those who look upon immigrants and refugees as the enemy as a result of these attacks, because they look like those who perpetrated, perpetrated these attacks, just as peaceful Jap Japanese Americans were viewed as the enemy after Pearl Harbor. But we must resist the urge to categorize and dehumanize, for it is that very impulse that fueled the insanity and violence that perpetrated this evening. Tonight, hold your loved ones and pray or wish for peace, not only from guns and bombs, but from hatred and fear. If it is our freedom and joy they seek to destroy, give them not that victory. Against the forces of darkness and terror, love and compassion shall always prevail. It's not hippie shit. It's really powerful. It's really powerful. Hatred doesn't cease through hatred, you know? Um, some of the most powerful experiences I've seen are, I think it was one of the fathers of a victim in Christchurch came out and said, I forgive this person. And I remember the shooting in Charleston, the church in Charleston, a number of years ago, they came out and said, you forgive this guy. That's powerful. They're not carrying, they, they're holding your grief, but they're not adding that extra layer of, of anger and hatred. Um, so there's that. And I just want to share one more thing. I went to a play, a couple of, it was only a show a couple of weeks ago, and then I went back again this week. And it was called um, Lackawanna Blues. And it was on Off Broadway about 18, 19 years ago. And he revived it and uh, it was in LA. It's quite extraordinary. It's this. A man who grew up in Lackawanna, New York, which is near Buffalo, in the late 50s, early 60s. And the woman who took care of him when he was growing up uh, was kind of the matriarch of the town. Um, it was, uh, he was black and she was black and it was an African-American community in this town. And she had a couple of boarding houses and she ran a taxi service and she had a little club. And anyway, she was... Um, it was really, he did, it was a one man show where he did all these characters. It was really quite extraordinary. And, um, he was talking about, she had a, um, they called her Nana or Nanny. They, she had a, a guy that she was, her boyfriend said she was involved with for many years, but he slept around all the time and it was kind of a known thing. And there was one point where there was this young woman staying in the boarding house and she came up to Nana and she goes, Nana, I just, I feel so bad. And Nana was like, oh, poor thing, you're, she was, she goes, what are you, 19? Sit down. You want something to eat? You need to have something to eat. You're not looking well. And she said, Nana, I'm pregnant and it's Bill's baby and Bill was her boyfriend. And Nana paused and she said, well, I'm going to have to find you another place to live. But why don't you have something to eat while you're here? You know, and that hit me. That was such tremendous compassion. Yet she was also taking care of herself. Somebody I was talking about this yesterday, they said she also expressed some tremendous compassion for herself. It's like, you can't live here anymore, but have something to eat. You know, there was no anger in her heart. It was softness and kindness and compassion. You know, that was, those types of things are extraordinary. Those are the types of things we remember. And so that's, that, that is one piece of how we deal with this. Try not to let our hearts harden. And start where you are. Because this is, this is postgraduate levels. This is postdoctorate kind of work that we do. You know, I, oh, no, wait, one more thing about this love thing. John, John Lewis is the, um, he's a congressman from the Atlanta area and he was hugely active in the civil rights movement. He was, he was there from the first lunch counter sit down in Nashville. He was the leader of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And I 
read his memoir a number of years ago, and before they sat down at a lunch counter, they had two years of nonviolence training. Two years of nonviolence training. I just met the man who did that training a couple of weeks ago. Um, awesome guy. Anyway, that's another story I'll tell you later. Um, so he um, he uh, was, I think it was on the bridge in Selma, Alabama. And he was crossing the bridge and he saw the person coming towards him with a baseball bat. I have to check this out, but this is the gist of it, if that's what the exact event. And he saw this man coming out with a baseball bat and he knew he was going to get hit over the head with his baseball bat. And he said it was taking everything he had to find the humanity in this person so he would not have hate in his heart. So they could, he couldn't, so he would not other this person. That's, that's something to have an intention to move towards. I think there's a lot of these stories, but I'll just start this a bit from now. So love is, is really cultivating that, um, that, that softening in our hearts. And that's if it is wise intention in the Eightfold Path to be with loving kindness and goodwill towards all beings. It's right there. That's how we set our intention and we start where we are, recognizing I have friends who go, I can't do that. I'm sorry. I hate that motherfucker. I'm like, you start where you are and you you experience what that feels like, you know? And and come have compassion for yourself because that's not part of the whole path, you know? No judgment. No judgment. So the second piece of this is action. To save without works is dead. I think and there's some book that has that written in it. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, there's, there's also some Christian stuff too. Um, and uh, so this is a, this Buddhism has a rap for being really passive. <clears throat> and in fact, I'm on the board of this organization, and it's an interfaith organization. And the, was a rabbi who said to me, he goes, you know, you've changed my view of Buddhists because his experience, Buddhists would just be there and just kind of wave at people and wish them, you know, compassion or something. You know, am I breathing too hard into this? Okay, just drinking a little feedback. Um, so it's really about, you know, there's the term engaged Buddhism, but I like to think I, I think that's some, you know, redundant. If you're paying attention, you should be engaged. You know, the first precept is about not causing harm, but it's not just about not causing harm. It's also about working to end suffering where we see it. And so taking action is really important. And there's tons of examples about that through, through um, in history, Ashoka, the emperor who was, uh, once he, he was in this great battle and saw all these people slaughtered, he was horrified and he, he, he adopted Buddhism and he spent the rest of his life helping people, you know, taking action. Um, so there's that. You have the example of Thich Nhat Hanh, who was in Vietnam when, you know, during the Vietnam War, he was, Vietnamese, he was there during the war. And he said, I can sit on my cushion or I can get up and do something. And so he got up and he started working. Um, you know, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh says, Action and meditation act together. Um, and so you have this base of peace, understanding, and loving kindness in ourselves so that we can take it out there. We have this foundation of mindfulness and ease or peace, and then move forward to take it out into the world and, and do what needs to be done. And Bhikkhu Bodhi, if you know him, he's a monk who's done, he's done a lot of the translations of the suttas. He's quite wise, but he's also an activist. He's also quite active. And he says, Yes, meditation is in seclusion, inwardly focused, but the embodiment of the Dharma in the world would be more complete by reaching out and addressing the grinding miseries that ail humanity. I like that. The embodiment of Dharma in the world would be more complete by reaching out and addressing the grinding misery that ails humanity. So the, that's the... the the ask is to get up and do something to um, address the, the grind and misery that so many people in the world experience. 
in um, engaged Buddhism is applied to our engagement as citizens in relation to service. So we are engaged in service, whatever that looks like, whatever that looks like. And there's a man, Charles Johnson, who's an author. Um, he wrote a great book called The Middle Passage, really excellent book, but he writes for Tricycle and I think Wines for Vermont. He said, right conduct, one of the um, you know, factors of the Eightfold Path, you translate, right conduct is to translate Dharma into specific actions of social responsibility. Translate Dharma into specific actions of social responsibility. Where you see something, do what you can. You know, again, start where you are. So how do you do that? I, I saw an article um, by um, Diana Winston. Some of you may know her. She's down at, she's a director of the Mindful Awareness Research Center at UCLA, but she's taught at Spirit Rock a lot too. And she wrote an article about how to be a bodhisattva. And if you know what a bodhisattva is, bodhisattva in Mahayana tradition is that being who foregoes their enlightenment. And so all beings are enlightened. You know, beings are numberless like that to save them all. No pressure. Yeah, no pressure. So, but she has these, um, I love it, eight steps to being a bodhisattva. But this is, I think, a good, a good a little, um, uh, thing to look at about how do we take action? Set an intention. That's what anything, the mind follows the mind. You want to set an intention to move in this direction. I want to be of service. I want to end suffering when I see it. How do I do that? You know, just you set an intention and then you take the action. Because saying, because without action, intention is just a, a mental exercise. How do you do that? So set an intention. Um, have some kind of a spiritual practice as a foundation. Meditation, this sitting, cultivating mindfulness is a really good spiritual practice to help you in this journey of, of taking action. Because you're paying attention. You're aware of what's going on. You're aware of what you're doing. You see, you can see your responses. You can perhaps respond rather than react. You can recognize when those emotions are arising, when there is anger. Not saying that anger is not going to be there, not saying that stuff's not going to arise, but when you're mindful, you're less likely to have it take over. You can respond and say, wow, there's anger present rather than anger. When you're lost in that anger, whatever the, the, the unwholesome, unwise, unskillful emotion is, you're doing things you don't know you're doing because you're caught up and not paying attention. So mindfulness, some kind of cultivation of spiritual practice is really important. This one is really, really a good one. I know some people who are activists and organizers and they struggle with this one. Non-attachment, letting go of the result. She says, think in geologic time. It's going to... Did I get in that feedback? Okay. Oh, I won't look over there anymore. Um, it's it's going to take a long time. It takes a long time to uh, work on this stuff. You know, this... Oh, what was it? Um... Yeah, the Jim, Reverend Jim Lawson is the man who did the training of, um, you know, the nonviolence training before they did the sit downs. And I was in a meeting with him a couple of weeks ago. He's a founder, one of the founders of, a, of an organization I'm on the board on, a board of. And he came to a, a day long retreat, a work retreat that we had. And, you know, it's like, it's almost like he's, he says, I'm still talking about this stuff. 50, 55, so he's 90. He's like, I'm still talking about this stuff, you know, almost 60 years later. It takes a long time. You know, this stuff, we didn't, this stuff, we want things to happen overnight. But if you just recognize, you think in geologic time and do what you can without expecting a particular result. It can be very disheartening if we want to see X, Y, or Z happen. And we, we burn out and we give up. But if you see the big picture and go, okay, it takes time. It takes work. It takes effort. Um, 
And in that same vein, she says, know the history. Know the history of racism. Know the history of Islamophobia. Know the history of homophobia. Know the history. See it. You know, that's why there's all these great books like The New Jim Crow is a great book. You know, the history of institution, um, you know, incarceration, mass incarceration. And, and it's just the history of our country. And I'm, I'm reading Trevor Noah's autobiography memoir right now, Born a, Born a Crime. I think that's it. But, you know, yeah, the history of apartheid. It's like, I didn't know the details of that. But you see, you explain step by step by step how it was put into place. You have to know this stuff so that you can see yourself. We're so focused on right now, especially with the 24-hour news cycle. You know, what's happening this second? What's happening in the second? We don't see the big picture. And the big picture is, you know, just this tide slowly moving and turning. And you're, we're all part of that tide. You know, we don't have to be Mother Teresa. We don't have to be Martin Luther King. We don't have to be grandiose. There's a... Um, Rick Hansen's newsletter came out a couple of weeks ago, um, or the one I got a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about a young man, someone who was born with HIV in South Africa, who Cozy Johnson. I forget when he was when he was alive, and he died at twelve of HIV AIDS, and but he was an active activist, um, and he said. I don't have the exact quote, but it's do what you can with what you have where you are in the time you have. Do what you can where you are with the time you have with what you have. Just really keep it. What can you do right now? What can you do today? What can you do in this minute? What do you have? What's your time? You know, can you go register a voter? Can you put a picket? Can you make a phone call? Can you tell somebody they're inappropriate? You know, can you can you draw a boundary? Can you speak up? What can you do? So getting away from that, it has to look like a certain thing. How what can you do to end suffering, whatever that might look like? Taking action and acting wisely, you know, take action, whatever that is. Like I just said, where you can with what you have and the time you have. She says, be in community, some kind of support. It's really easy to be alone or we can get isolated, but you need to have some kind of support, some kind of people who can reflect back to you, who can catch you when you're like, Whoa, who can tell you, take the day off. You know, you need to nourish yourself. Burnout is so easy, but you need to have someone to, you know, to, to be with people who are on the path with you. That's, you know, take refuge in the Sangha. If whatever your Sangha looks like, have a community that you can trust. It doesn't have to be a bazillion people. It could maybe be one or two people that you really, really trust and that you can go to. Cultivating that, cultivating those relationships with others is really important. Your little Kalyana Mita, your, your group of spiritual friends. You know, I have friends like that I never see because they live somewhere else, but I could, you know, you, you call them up and you talk and it's like you've never been apart. You know, so if you can have some kind of support, it's really important. This is a good one. There will be obstacles. It's not going to go the way you want it to go. There's going to be external the obstacles and there'll be internal obstacles there'll be self-doubt there'll be that judgment there'll be that criticism there'll be the the fear i'm not ready i can't do this who do i think i am there'll be you know people coming at you especially today it's people are so much they're so quick to attack Um, which might feed into how you feel about yourself. So don't, lesson one, don't read the comments. <laughs> That's what I hear from everybody. And then they went, I read the comments. 
Oh, I'm geeking out a bit now. It's like, don't the comments. Um, you know, but just know there's going to be obstacles. This ties in with that. It's going to take a long time. It's going to take a long time. When Trump got elected, I said, I'm sorry. I'm not going to live long enough to see how this all unfolds. Because it's not going to just end. There's, there's long-term ramifications that I may not live long enough to see how it unfolds. And so to have that, you know, that awareness that this, you know, this, this continuity, this continuum, this, this shifting, this ripples, that, that it's big. What can you do? You know, where can you, what action can you take? Just do it. Um, yeah, and try and live a meaningful life as much as you can. You know, I don't know, whatever that means to you. Um, and I didn't have any notes on that. And it's been a couple of weeks since I read the article. So that might be a really sad number eight, but that's the last one. So the other piece that I wanted to uh, talk about this is um, that I always need to mention is that, um, as I talked about the, this one guy who thought that Buddhists were just like, oh, magic pixie dust and everything's okay that um, this is a practice of absolute accountability, that we are accountable for our actions and we hold other people accountable for their actions. You know, it's like, it's not um, this mushy, oh, I'm supposed to cultivate compassion, therefore you can do whatever the hell you want to me. That's not what it is. It's like, I, um, I don't hold animosity towards you in my heart, but you, you can't come to my house and actually you might need to go away. Maybe you need to be put away. Maybe you need to be physically stopped from like the harm you were causing because you're so caught up in your greed and your hatred and your delusion that you're causing incredible amounts of harm and you cannot be doing this anymore but I don't hate you. So it's about taking action to end that. It's about holding people accountable for what they've done. But we don't, for ourselves, we don't get into the guilt and the shame. It's about, which is incredibly freeing for any of you who've ever been caught up in guilt and shame. I don't know, it's probably one or two in this room. <laughs> it's um, recognizing that oh yeah, I screwed up. I did something that caused harm. I made a mistake. Maybe because of my conditioning, maybe because I just got caught up in the moment and I was incredibly unskillful and I hurt you. I can still do that but, um, verbally. I'm very good verbally at, at hurting people, not physically. I'll just sit there and go, Um, so it's about being careful and going, I'll own it. I own it. I did that. I, can I, can I do anything to fix it and set the intention to not do it again? So it's not like berating ourselves because the berating is just like, oh, I'm so bad. I'm so bad. It's like, that doesn't serve anything. That's the second, third, fourth, fifth arrow that we shoot ourselves with. The first arrow is like, oh, I did that. Oh, I'm so unskillful. Don't need to pile on. Don't need to pile on. So to recognize that there's personal accountability and accountability for someone else. Okay, here's my story about that, which just happened today. I posted this photograph that they used for my flyers. A friend of mine took that picture a couple of years ago. And I said, damn, a lot of people are using it. I wanted to just give her a shout out. So I put it on Facebook today and gave her a shout out saying thank you. Cause it was just, she just took a picture and gave it to me, it was really sweet. And um, my brother-in-law, my husband's brother, um, who I haven't seen or talked to in five years, six years. Cause the last time we had any contact, he was threatening to kill my husband. He said, I know where you live. I'm going to come. I'm going to shoot you. I'm going to blah, blah, blah. Really not nice. Scary to a certain extent. But we also know he's a big mouth and does nothing. So it was like scary, but yeah, he's probably just fucked up. And, he's, <laughs> and today I see on that, he commented, nice picture. 
And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you don't get just to walk back into our lives. No, you don't get to do that. So that, you know, I, just, I don't know if I'll just delete the comment and block him or whatever. I think I might just do that. I just, you know what? I talked to his niece a couple of years ago and she goes, yeah, I don't know. It's not, um, my heart, I, I, I wish him well. I hope he gets the healing he needs, but you don't get to come waltzing into my life. That's not okay. That's a boundary, but without hate. I'm, I'm like, I have this, this sense of equanimity around that. You know, that I'm incredibly grateful for, but it took the work of this practice of sitting on the cushion, of paying attention, of really being willing to hmm, feel it and being kind to myself, being compassionate to myself. That is that, that's like, I think that's such a key. It's a key to unlock that, that, that wall of separation that keeps us from each other. When we can be kind to ourselves, we can open up to others. And it's, it's about letting go of that separation, about really being able to have this unconditional compassion for others. Look at these great spiritual leaders like the Dalai Lama or Thich Nhat Hanh. They have that. They have this lightness. They have this joy. And they have this great compassion. And also this like, no, 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 no. Peace. No bullshit. So I like that. So those are my thoughts about this. And I'm happy to have any questions or comments. And how does this land for you guys? I'd love to hear that. And, I'm not going to get into the specifics, but how do you know what right view is? How do you, like there's this problem that I have, which is I get attached to mm -hmm. you. And so how do I know what right view is? Because if I'm in a situation where I think I have right view, but I happen to know that a lot of people, millions, disagree with Mm -hmm. And so, how do I know? I mean, if, if I'm going to, like, spend time as an activist, making the world, like, working with intention mm -hmm. to try and make the world what I think is a better place, wouldn't those millions agree if I was right? Not necessarily. Because they may be caught up in their delusion. There's a lot of you know, there's a lot of people who will vehemently disagree with you about wise view, you know. And so I think for wise view, it's to really see the that you know to understand the nature of suffering, and that suffering is is about clinging and craving and wanting things to be good all the time and not recognizing that you know what. To quote the Buddha, shit happens, you know, and that I think that 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 xenophobia that's sweeping the country right now, and the all the backlash and all the, the, the just the hatred that's bubbling up or coming out of the just coming out of the woodwork. It's been there, but it's just coming out of the woodwork and all the hate crimes. What was it? All these churches in Louisiana just this week were were torched, and the the social justice center. In Alabama, I think it was was um, was uh, there was arson with white power signs last week. I mean, it's it's happening, it's happening, it's happening. So those people would disagree with you because they're caught up in their fear, they're caught up in their othering, and it's like so. Wise, wise view is seeing clearly. Um, um, okay, this is this is this is causing harm. This is causing harm. You know, and if you. So I also, you know, sometimes if you are not clear, check with that spiritual community you have as well. And understand it's, that's the myth. If I just explain it to them, then they'll understand. That's the huge myth that we fall into. It's not true. It's not true. Um, there, some people just, there's dust in their eyes. Like the Buddha was saying, I don't want to teach. And 
people said, well, there's some people just a little desperate in their eyes. They're not caught up in their confusion and their greed and their hatred. They're almost ready to see and they just need your teachings. And there's some people who are so caught up in their fear for whatever reason, for the conditions that they've had in their lives. They can't see the different way. They're so skewed. They're so skewed. You know, you wish them well and then you say, no, you can't do that. You know? Yeah. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, I hear you. It is hard. And um, I think that's why the big picture is really important because our lifetimes are nothing. We're gnats eyelash. In the history of, of, of humankind, we were much less violent than we, we've ever been. It seems we're not because technology makes it possible to destroy so much so quickly. But the... the uh, Emphasis on social justice and equality is, is greater and human rights is, is bigger than it's ever been before. And um, I don't think this stuff that's coming out of the woodwork is new. It's been there. It's been insidious. Now, oh, now we can see it. Now we know what it is. It went underground for a long time, especially the, the racism just went underground. And now it's like out. And it's like, so maybe it'll be easier to root out. So there's also the other side of the coin saying, yeah, it was going to take a long time anyway, but now we see it full on what's happening. So maybe it can be addressed, you know, in that way. Yeah. Thank you, Martha. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. It's a challenge, and you know, you're not the only person who feels that way. And, and the only, the only thing I would throw in there is the actor and the actions. You know, that's that. That's what we have to. Can I separate the actor from the action? And you may not be able to. And to start where you are, and to have compassion for yourself, to go. I, I hate this man, and that's all I can do. I have friends who say that in class. Like, that's where you are. Can you hold yourself with compassion around that? And what I will say, have the idea that there is a possibility that maybe I can come to a place where I don't have hold that hatred. And it just as a, as a concept, without a, yeah, never, but just like, who knows? Maybe it's a possibility someday without berating yourself. That's the hugely important piece. And um, I want to honor the time. It's 9.01. So y'all should hang out and talk to each other um, and say, how do you do this or whatever? And a um, couple of announcements. I'm doing a day long here tomorrow about really looking at that conditioning. What? No. Don't come because you don't want to look at the condition. Uh, so that's that. And I have a mailing list that I put up there too with all the other little mailing lists. So if you're so inclined to get on my mailing list. And I am doing a retreat 
registration just opened down in Big Bear up in the mountains in August. So that's August 14th to 19th. So um, it's on my website, although I don't have any flyers or anything. So that's all I have. So any other announcements? There's our Donna announcement. Are you doing anything? Yeah, well, first of all, I want to thank you so much, Mary, for sharing your wisdom and sharing your time with us tonight. We are so fortunate to have you here. Um, and we're so fortunate as, uh, as, as a community to be able to bring teachers like Mary um, here to, to share with us. And um, most of you have been here before, but those of you who have not, um, we are an entirely student-led, student-run organization. Um, and we sustain ourselves entirely on uh, Donna donations. Um, and um, uh, we're all volunteers. And if you're interested in getting involved in that, uh, please talk to me or talk to Sharon from the office. <laughs> yeah, um, and we have a number of ways to give to, to uh, support the center. Um, and all that, that's exactly where that money goes. We can just support the center, pay the rent, keep the lights on, and be able to pay our teachers as well. Um, so you can give at the little box there. Um, our suggested do donation is $20, but that's one of our ways. And there is no upper limit. Like, if that is you know, what you have and where you are, and et cetera. Um, as Mary was saying, um, you can also use Venmo and we take cards. And we also um, have um, uh, sustaining members who give on a monthly basis. So if you go to our website, sfdrumcollective, you can find out more, uh, dot org. And it also contains our calendar uh, for all the teachers. We have programming almost every night of the week. So um, uh, we have a lot of day long, half day long going on as well. So check that out. We're also on all the social medias. So you have your Facebook, Twitter, your Instagram. Um, so it's all there, and I want to thank everyone for coming tonight and welcome those um, who haven't been here before, and welcome back to people who have been here in the past. Um, so thank you so much, and, and thank you so much, Mary. It was great to be in here, and may any goodness that has come from our practice tonight be carried in our hearts as we walk out that door, and may any goodness be carried out to all corners of the world. All beings. Happy, healthy, all beings, all beings.